morning church you know i feel like we are a bit caught up uh, and uh, you know while worshiping time we are like little, little stiff and all can we just be free in the presence of god yeah is it okay to say an amen when 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 you are been inspired by a word or you know word of encouragement or word of wisdom from the pulpit when somebody speaks is it okay to say an amen is it okay to reciprocate is it okay to lift your hands and worship it is not just for the leaders of the church it is for everybody hallelujah is it okay to just lift hands and shout let me just tell you we are new life fellowship I had to just reinstate that. Yeah. Why? Because we are known for vibrant worship. We are known for vibrant word and we are known for vibrant fellowship. And I will not settle for anything less than that. I come from a traditional background and I know how it is. So I don't want this to become like that and I'm concerned. Yeah, so if, if you see, if, if there is a worship going on, I know that it is so hard for, you know, we are all coming from a different, uh, you know, frame of mind. But you are coming into the presence of God. And Bible says where there is the presence of God, there is freedom. And how many of you are ready for that experiencing that freedom of God today as you are here? And when you worship today, the worship was very powerful and I could not stand there. Let me just tell you, every word that comes, every lyrics of the word of the lyrics, you know, it is so powerful to impact us. And if it is not, we need to just ask ourselves, what are we doing? So I'm just encouraging all of you, if you hear a word and you know if you if you are here for worshiping the lord make sure that you are actually reciprocating and you are not just you know standing there and just doing nothing yeah praise god for all the wonders god is good and all the time thanks to don moin who wrote that song but not everything is good everything is not good the world we live in is not very good. Yeah, we hear every day, we hear news, we hear things which is not going the way we thought it would go. The leaders, we thought that they would actually, you know, bring justice and peace. They are not doing that. Maybe we thought this person would, but that is not. The wicked, they are prospering. The righteous, they are languishing. The loved ones are getting sick, there is calamities, there is pandemic, there is epidemic, and you know, there are earthquakes, there are things which is happening in our world, and let me just tell you, everything is not good in this world. And we look forward for a world where God would make everything good. There are desperations, there are disappointments, there are discouragements, there are famine in our land. All pointing towards one heaven and one earth where everything will be all right. You know, amidst this, as we ponder upon those words which I told you, these realities which, which is hitting us daily when we open our, our, our you know, internet or our TVs and we are hit by this reality that not everything is okay or with this world. With that word, can I just turn your attention to Isaiah chapter 35? Can I request all of you to turn your Bibles, maybe flip your Bibles or turn it, turn the pages or maybe, you know, slide your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 35. And I just want to read from verse 1, verse 2 and verse 8. And from the NKJV version, you can have any other versions, no problem. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom at the, as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Verse 8, 
a highway shall be there and a road and it shall be called as a highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. Can we just close our eyes? Heavenly Father, this is your word. And you may be pray, God, that you may speak to each one of us. And Lord, convict our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. The book of Isaiah is a tough nut to crack for many of us. Yeah? We like to skip some of the verses we don't understand some of the uh, phrases. We actually skip, we like to have some of the good verses that we have marked in our Bibles and we, we love to, you know, reinstate those verses. But let me just tell you, this book of Isaiah is one of the powerful book in the Bible. I'll explain to you why the reason is, you know, one, Isaiah is speaking about the near future, maybe 10 to 20 years from his day of preaching. He is even speaking about 100 years later that a, a kingdom called Babylon will come and conquer. He is even speaking about 150 years later about a man called Cyrus which is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 44. Cyrus is not even born, but Isaiah is prophesying 150 years from that day about a man called Cyrus whom God will raise and make him king and he will bring deliverance to the people of Israel. Okay? He is even prophesying 700 years later about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who will come and who will rule in justice and in his coming there will be no, there will not be any problem but there will be like sick getting healed, the blind getting, you know they will see, the blinds are seeing, the, the lame getting, you know all these things are mentioned in Isaiah and with this simple man like you and me and his name is Isaiah. That's why I said the book of Isaiah is one of the most powerful book. If you, if you, if you don't skip it, if you don't, you know, uh, you know, just want to read some of, let me just tell you, it has all 20 years. There is 100 years later, there is a prophecy. There is a prophecy of 150 years later. There is a prophecy even after 700 years of what Isaiah was living. There is a mention of all those things in the book of Isaiah. And this man is just a simple man who is standing as a priest. He was a priest in the temple. And this is the guy who was actually, you know, listen to me very carefully as I explain this context so that you will, when you read Isaiah, it will be easy for you. You know, he was living in the 8th century, around 700 BC, and he was just a normal priest in the temple of the Lord. This guy called Isaiah. His name means God is salvation, or God is our savior, or, you know, we get salvation through our gods. That's the name of the word Isaiah. Yeah, we speak Isaiah in Hindi, sorry, in English, but in, um, here in Hebrew, Yeshaya. So, the word means God is our salvation. And this guy is a priest in the temple of the Lord. And at that point of time, when he was working as a temple priest, you know, the country was doing well under the leadership of King Uzziah. Everything was fine. Let me just tell you, the great army at that point of time was Assyria. They were not attacking Israel, or maybe Judah. You know why? Because of King Uzziah. And it is mentioned, I will explain to you about more about King Uzziah in the, coming, in the coming points. But let me just tell you, the prophet Isaiah, if you read from chapter 1 to 12, you see that you know, there, is, there is a lot of uh, discussions on the local just injustice and inequality, the oppressed, and the, he's uh, speaking against the leaders, he's speaking against the king, he's speaking against all those things that are mentioned. But the vision of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 changed his entire perspective and he shifts his focus from the local thing to the whole world. And after that you will see that you know, there is a woe to the nations, there is woe to the kingdoms, there is woe to this, there is woe to that. 
his shift, his focus shifts from being a very local to something most powerful. And that all happened because of that one vision he saw in Isaiah chapter 6. And it is written that, you know, on the, on the, in the year King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. I told you, it is not right with our world. Nothing is good in our world. We may think that so-and-so person will bring justice into this world. I still remember last year, there were a lot of prophecy which was going around that, you know, Mr. So-and-so will become the president of the United States. And you know what? And there were so many people who were prophesying day and night and they were doing upside down everything, but nothing happened. And then we thought that it is about, you know, the next person who will come to power and he will bring justice. The same thing happened to Isaiah. He is actually, you know, he is in the, he is as a priest enjoying the serenity, enjoying the peaceful atmosphere, enjoying the security, enjoying the provision of the Lord. And he suddenly, the king dies. And he is perplexed, he is confused, he don't know what to do next. There is a lot of uncertainty into his life. And he don't know what next. And that's the reason why it is written in the year King Uzziah died. That you know, there were all uncertainty that he saw a vision of the Lord. And the vision was like the Lord is seated on the throne. Somebody say with me, the Lord is seated on the throne. Let me just tell you, if you feel that things are not going the way you thought... Or even not going the way even people thought. Let me just tell you, God is still seated on his throne. And let me just tell you how he is seated. He is not just seated over there. He is seated high and lifted up. If you can actually remember this word, he is still seated on the throne. Nations will rage. You know, kingdoms will fight. But let me just tell you, God is in control of everything. The Bible says he holds everything in his palm of his hands and he decides what to do next. He decides which kingdom will, you know, rise, which kingdom will fall. Who decides? That's my God who is seated on the throne high and lifted up. It is not on any person of this world who will bring the kingdom of God. Bible says the Lord will bring the kingdom of God. And you or me are subjects to that kingdom. Are you excited this morning? You know, I'm here to just give you a message of comfort in this, you know, very uncertain world. You may feel that, you know, things are, maybe, you know, in India, things are not going, you know, doing well. We, we, see, we hear the news and suddenly our whole day, you know, I just decided recently that I will not, morning, I will not see the news. Why? The moment you put on the news, the whole day is messed up. The whole day is actually just gone. You know why? Because so and so thing is happening in this part of the world and so and so injustice is happening in this part of the world. And this person is supposed to do this. He did not do that. There is killing. There is, uh, you know, injustice. There is a lot of uncertainty. There is a lot of chaos in our world. But the morning when you get up in the presence of God, open your Bible and see that the Lord is seated on the throne and he's high and lifted up. Nothing in this world is ever out of control because God is still in it. Amen. And he is working in ways that we cannot see. To bring justice and equality into this world. Yeah. So today, as we, uh, as we move ahead, I have like from this chapter onwards, I have like three points. Remember it is I, I have today, I have not prepared any PPTs and all. Um, but it is easy. You will remember these three points. Isaiah 35 is first, it's about God. Second, it is about his work. And third, it is about his ways. I remember, just remember three, three W's. One, God's word, not just the, the big W, yeah, not the, uh, sorry, not the small W, which is the word of God. It's a big W, God's word, the spoken, the promises of God. That's the first point. Second is God's work. 
and third is God's ways. Remember these three points as we exegete from this, from this passage. It says, you know, chapter 35, verse 1 to 3, that, you know, the wilderness and the wasteland and the desert will rejoice and blossom as a rose. You know why? Because the Lord is going to do it. If you come to verse 5, it says, if you can put it in NLT version, verse 5 of the same chapter, it is written, you'll be surprised to know the, the, the translation when NKG writes, then, but NLT, it gives a very beautiful um, a uh, very beautiful explanation. And it is written, And when he comes, he will open the eyes and, the un and unstop the ears of the deaf. When he comes. Can you say this? When the Lord comes into my life, things will change. Yeah? Uncertainties will change. You know, impossibilities will become possible. You know why? Because the Lord will come into my life and he will th change the things which I thought would never happen and he will do it. He will open the eyes of the blind. The deaf will hear. The lame will walk. The dead will rise. You know why? These are not just, you know, simple uh, statements for saying it. These are the realities. When God comes, he will establish everything. Remember the prayer when the disciples came to Jesus and they asked Jesus, Jesus, can you just teach us how to pray, what to pray? And Jesus said, pray like this, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Why is Jesus talking about thy kingdom come? Can't just God just come and just, you know, conquer everything and, you know, just change everything? No, that's the reason we all are here. You know why? So that we will establish the kingdom of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason why each one of us have a mandate. And the mandate is to have a glimpse of the kingdom of God in this world. And Jesus himself is saying, I will help you. But you need to understand that it will work in the way that God wants to work. So the first point is God's ways. You know, King Uzziah, he was actually... Um, he was, if you come to 2 Chronicles chapter 26, it is mentioned that King Uzziah was, you know, a, 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 a very prosperous king and he became king at the very young age of 16, okay? At the very young age of 16, he became the king, he, he became the king after the murder, you know, he, somebody murdered his father, Amaziah, and then he came to the, to the, uh, to become the king of that place. So if you can come with me to, uh, to 2 Chronicles chapter 26 and i will we will uh, look at that you know the entire life of king uzziah he is also known as azariah and he became king at the age of 16 and it is written in second chronicles 26 verse 5 verse 5 it is written that he sought the lord who uzziah sought the lord in the days of zechariah who had understanding in the visions of god and as long as he sought the lord god made him Prosper. I have a concern. Let me just make it very clear. I come to know like you know, a certain person is suffering and I didn't, I didn't know that. And I asked this person, brother, what happened? You didn't tell me. Oh, pastor, I thought I will not disturb you. I am here for that work. And if you don't disturb me, can you say to the Lord, Lord, I didn't want to pray because I didn't want to disturb you. Because you are just busy with different things of this world. No. Please listen to me. If you have a concern, if you have a prayer request, if you are struggling, please reach out. We will pray for you. And we will see that, you know, God is glorified in your life and you will be successful. Amen. Amen. So here it is written that in the days of Zechariah, he sought the Lord and... God made him prosper. He was a very successful king. And it is written, chapter, same chapter, verse 15, if you can come. It is written that he made devices in Jerusalem, invented by skillful men, to be on the towers and, and the corners. Some people say the catapult. Okay, we have heard of this catapult, right? That was first discovered 
by Uzziah. I'm not talking about the small one, the big ones, which will throw big, big stones far, you know, miles and miles apart. It was actually invented by, that's the reason verse 15 says, he made devices in Jerusalem invented by skilled men during the time of Uzziah. To shoot arrows and large stones, you see that? So who invented all these things? The first king who invented was not some scientific guy. It was King Uzziah. You know why? Because the Lord was with him. Read that. So his fame spread far and wide. He was marvelously helped till he became strong. In other translation, he was marvelously held until he became strong. You know, God loves us and he wants to give the best in our life. He actually wants to, you know, bless us. But there is just one thing he cannot just stand and that is pride. That is just pride. It is written that he was marvelously helped. As long as he was seeking the Lord, as long as God was the center of his life, as long as God was first in his life, as long as he was serving and he was seeking in the days of Zechariah, the Lord helped him. But remember this, after the days of Zechariah, Zechariah maybe had become old, he died. We don't know what happened to him. But after the days of Zechariah, what happened? He thought, I know the ways of the Lord. Read the very next verse. First is, he became strong. Verse 16 says, and when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. And he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn the incense on the altar of incense. In those days, it is only the priest who can actually do that. And that priest had to be from the descendant of Aaron and Levi. Only those people can do it. But here, King Uzziah, he saw that, you know, I know Zechariah. He was my close buddy. Because of him, I came to know the Lord, praise the Lord. Everything is going the way he thought. But there is just one thing he couldn't, you know, maybe work on his life, and that was pride. And when pride comes into your life, things will slowly go down. You will not even realize that. I'm reminded of Isaiah. Come back to Isaiah chapter 14. I will just give you five I wills of somebody. You know it very, very, very dearly. Isaiah chapter 14. Verse 12 onwards, the five I wills of Lucifer. Okay? From verse 12 to 14 in NKJV. Look at this. Verse 13 says, Lucifer said in his heart, five I wills. The first is, verse 3, verse 13, I will ascend into heaven. I will, second I will list, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Third I will, I will sit on the mount of the congregation. Fourth I will, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Fifth I will, and I will be like the most high. You see, the pride, when it comes into your heart, you actually give undue importance to who you are. You actually give no importance to others or have no consideration of who the other person is. And then this pride actually can come inside and it will overcome you. And then you will feel like, I will... Be like God himself. Beware, church. But the Lord is saying in verse 15, 
Lucifer is saying, I will ascend, I will exalt, I will sit, I will ascend high, I will be like God. God is saying, but you shall be brought down to the Sheol. You know how down? To the lowest depths of the pit. God cannot stand pride. No matter you are the king of the country or you are the, maybe the normal person in that country. God cannot stand pride. And that's what happened. God gave him prosperity. God, he, he was marvelously helped, Uzziah. He was marvelously helped. God gave him prosperity. God gave him success. God gave him wisdom. God gave him ideas. God gave him everything so that he would actually, you know, be a strong king in that place. And yes, he, was, he became very strong. That's what the Bible says. He became strong. The kingdom could not, you know, come and invade this land. You know why? Because God was their help until he was lifted up in his heart and he began to think that I am all in all and I can do everything, you know, without God. And I am actually, you know, I have this talent I have. I can do this because of me. The country has become prosperous. It's a dangerous stand to take. The Lord stuck him. Come back to 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 19 onwards. It says, Uzziah, when the priest, priest Azariah came and, you know, confronted him and said, you know, this is not what you should be doing. This is not your work. Please get out of the temple. He became angry. Verse 19 says he was furious on the priest. And while he was still angry, leprosy broke out on his forehead. Before the priest in the house of God, verse 20 says, he also hurried to go out because the Lord stuck him. The Lord stuck him. He was cut off, verse 21, he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Not just from the house of the Lord, he was cut off from even the king's palace. He was kept until his death. He was secluded from the whole people. He lived a very solitary life without anybody to help him. And he became a leper. You know, even on his deathbed, it is written, verse 23, people said about this guy, he is a leper. He is a leper. Pride, you may think that, you know, I don't have pride, but just, just, just ask yourself. If you give undue importance to yourself, and if you actually consider others not fit for anything, you have a subtle pride inside your heart. Or maybe you are actually giving undue glory to yourself. Maybe you are not realizing it. It will maybe, it is maybe out of, you know, insecurity. If you are insecure, let me just tell you the right place to go is the presence of God. If you feel insecure about your position, if you feel insecure about your job, if you feel insecure about your relationships, go to the presence of God and just give him the ruling thing of your life and he will take care of you. But if you are insecure... That should not lead you to pride because once pride comes, God will hate that pride. And he doesn't like pride. He did not even spare Lucifer, the morning star, the worship leader of the entire king. He was the most fairest. Yeah? God did not leave him. It did not, God did not leave Uzziah who was the king of, at that point of time. God did not leave Uzziah. He was stuck. The Lord stuck him. Come before his presence, church, as we know that this is about God. And you know what? This is happening, and the king is dead, and the next king is Jotham. He, he did good. Isaiah was still the prophet, and he did good, and he was like, wow, praise the Lord. Jotham is doing well. You know, he's fine. And after that comes Ahaz. He was the wicked king, and Isaiah is thinking, oh, no, this is, this is not going according. He's not listening to me. You know, this guy is just going against the word of God and he's just maybe, you know, he's sacrificing to the idols. He's making altars in different parts of the world, parts of this country. This is not good. And Isaiah is sad again. And after his death comes the next king who is King Hezekiah. And he again comes back 
and he established the kingdom of God. He established no peace of God. He established in the nation prosperity and peace and all. But what happened? <coughs> Hezekiah, you know the story of Hezekiah and Sena Cherub who, was, who came to invade uh, Hezekiah and the Lord helped him because of Isaiah. Isaiah and Hezekiah together. You know the story. I'm not going in details. But again, Isaiah was actually again disheartened to see that this guy Hezekiah, after the victory God gave him in Isaiah chapter 36 to 39, you know, he actually did a foolish thing by asking, you know, this, uh, this Babylon, the people of Babylon who were very small at that point of time to come and see the, the treasuries of the temple of the Lord and he did all those things. And you know what happened? Isaiah was very upset. And he said that this Babylon, because you unwisely let the visitors from Babylon see the palace treasures, he prophesied that this foolish act would lead to the future Babylonian exile. And Hezekiah was so happy. You know why? Because it is not going to happen in, this, in, the, in his lifetime, so it is okay. And just look at the situation of Isaiah. He is actually, he has seen the kings starting from the father of Uzziah. Yeah, when he was born, Uzziah's father might have been, you know, king in that place. He saw the king, the reign of Uzziah, and he was a good king, but the end he became bad. Then it was Jotham, he was a good king. Then it came Ahaz, who was a wicked king. Then it came Hezekiah, but this guy was foolish enough that he was doing things on his own. He was showing everybody, and he did foolish act, and he is thinking in his heart. Isaiah is thinking... You know, these guys, I was thinking that they would bring justice to this world, but they will not bring justice to this world. You know why? Because God will bring justice to this world. That's the reason why in Isaiah chapter 6, it is a beautiful, beautiful statement which he makes. In Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and his train of his robe filled the temple. And you know what? These people, the seraphim, they are like angels, okay? Seraphims are not like some mechanical beings. They are angels. They had six wings. They covered their face. They covered their feet. Then they, they, they flew and they cried to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of the glory of God. And he saw this vision and he's telling, you know, it is not about King Uzziah. It is not about this king, that king. It is about the king of kings and the Lord of lords who will establish everything and he will bring back justice and peace into this world. Can we just ask you that, can you invite this king of kings to rule over your life? Can you just say this prayer, Lord, let your kingdom come into my life. It is not about me. It is not about this person. It is not about my company. It is not about this country I am staying. It is not about my work. It is not about anything. It is about the king of kings. He is high and lifted up on his throne. And you don't have to worry. He is all taken care of. And that leads me to the second point, And that is God's work. It is written in Isaiah chapter 35. Come back to the verse 35. It is written that when he comes, verse 5, the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb will sing. The waters will burst forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool. The thirsty land will spring. It will become a spring of water. You know why? Because God is working on it. You know, I was, there was a time when, um, I still remember when I was in Bangalore and um, we were having a very small church, 2014, 15 and all, a very small church with I think six, seven families and me and my wife, we will, we will every week, Sunday morning, we will pray, Lord, send a new family uh, to this church today, anyone who is from the white field and will be looking outside from the window if there is anybody new coming, you know, if any new car comes and we'll say, oh, there's a new family who is coming and then we are excited, you know, pastor and the wife, they're outside the hall welcoming them, the worship is going inside, that was the situation. And that point of time, there was, um, you know, uh, uh, so many families came and they were uh, blessed by the service, they were blessed, but they were not sustaining, they were not sustaining. They will, they will like, you know, they will come for like one week and two weeks maybe and the third week they disappear. And that will actually bring again, you know, 
I will feel sad and I was desperate. I was asking God, Lord, what is this, you know? I want to see that the kingdom of God is established. I want to see people's life changed. I want to see the quality of the people to grow. And I want to see that they will be blessed and they will in turn be bless, uh, blessing others. And that is what my vision is. But then this is not happening the way I am thinking. And you know what happens? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17 to 18, God gave me God strengthened me by this word, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17 to 18. But the Lord stood with me, strengthened me, so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And come back to Isaiah chapter 35. There is a mention about, verse 9 says, there won't be a lion... There won't be a ravenous beast. There will, there, it will be a habitation of jackals. Let me just tell you, God is working in your life. So being confident, as Philippians 1.6 says, of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. You just have to stand with God. Can you just say an amen to God and say, Lord, I, I'm okay, you working in my life. Is it okay? You can tell God, Lord, I've been working all this while thinking that, you know, this person or that person, I was thinking it is about that person. I was thinking it is about me. But it is not about me as we heard. It is about God. And second thing is it is about God's work. And God is working through each one of you to see that the kingdom of God is coming. Amen. You know, you may not see things happening right now. You may see that, you know, it is all mundane things happening. Every day is just normal. I'm just going to my work and there is nothing good happening. I'm just coming back. I'm in the same job for last 10 years or 20 years and there is no good thing happening. To, I cannot see anything exciting happening into my life. You may feel all this thing, but still, let me just tell you, God is working in your life to see the kingdom of God, to establish his kingdom through your life and in your life. Can you stand with God and say, Lord, let your kingdom come. Lord, let your kingdom come through me, in me, for your glory. Amen. So as we, as we actually, you know, go for this, is the third point that I want to bring it, and that is God's way, and it is God's rule. And we will actually see this a bit, and as, uh, come with me to chapter, verse 8. The highway shall be there, and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, and it shall be for others who walks the road, although a fool shall not go astray. You know, just, constant, just look at this verse. It says, the unclean will not pass over it, but the fool, they can. You saw that? Verse, na verse 8. The unclean, they will not pass. Who are these unclean? And who are the other group of people? But it says that the, the, the other group of people mentioned there is the redeemed, verse 9, the ransomed, the rescued. They will enter and they will rejoice. The unclean will not enter, but the redeemed and the ransomed and the rescued will rejoice on that road. I was just asking, Lord, what is this unclean people? Who are these unclean people mentioned in the word? If you see that they are the people who are trusting in Egypt for their help. They are the people who have despised the name of the Lord. They have despised the word of God. If you can read from Isaiah chapter 1, you will see some of these verses I'm explaining. I'm not going for the verse details. They are the people who are despising his word. They don't care about who God is. You know, we remember King Ahaz. It's mentioned in Isaiah. King Ahaz, Isaiah went to him and, you know, somebody is attacking him. And Isaiah went to him and said, you ask for a sign. And God will do it for you. And this guy is like, I don't want to, have to ask God a sign. What? And then Isaiah is saying, okay, I will give you a sign. You know, this is the sign. In chapter 9. You know, they despise the word of God. They don't care about who God is. And in one of the places it is written, you know, the, the, the donkey, they know their master. The mule, they know its master. But where is my glory? Where is my respect which is due my name? In chapter 1 it is written. And then in verse 2, he is mentioning that, you know, you have considered me the holy one of Israel. 
and you have despised me and these are the people who despise the word of god for them god is not the first god is maybe the secondary maybe their job is the first maybe things what they do is the first and god is saying these people will not enter the kingdom of god on the highway of holiness people who actually are been washed by the blood of jesus only they can enter the kingdom of this highway of holiness you know it is written if you can come with me who are the people who can enter verse number 1 those who waited on the lord isaiah chapter 25 verse 9 says isaiah is saying on that day behold this is our god we have waited for him that he might save us this is the lord we have waited for him let us be glad and rejoice so number 1 who are this on the who are the people who are on this road of holiness they are the one who have waited on the lord for their entire life number 2 those who are trusted in his name isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 says you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trust in you who can walk on the on the road of on this highway of holiness it is not the unclean it is not the beast it is not the lion it is not the jackals it is the people who actually waited on the lord people who actually trust in the name of the lord and third people who are clean can enter how can you be clean ezekiel sorry revelation chapter 7 verse 13 says that you know there was a elder who was actually showing john that you know can you just see who are these people who are all in white robes can you do you know who these people are in revelation chapter 7 and uh, john says no i don't know who these people are you may know who these people are and he says these are the ones who are washed in the robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white <coughs> i just want to you know thank the lord for all those people who are washed in the blood of jesus because you are going to walk in the way of that highway of holiness on that highway there will not be you know any pain there will not be anyone who will come and attack you but make sure that you are sticking on that highway okay don't just slip off the highway because the lion is waiting for you the jackals are waiting for you darkness is waiting for you just stick on the highway in the highway of holiness wash yourself clean ezekiel chapter 36 verse 25 to 26 says then i will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean and i will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols and i will give you a new heart and i will give you a new spirit within you and i will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of of flesh we actually are you know very privileged that god has given this privilege of you know knowing this god if there is anybody seated over here and you don't know actually what is this highway of holiness and you want to walk in this highway of holiness let me just tell you you know there is salvation available for you and it is free of cost you need to wash your robe it is a you know allegorical way of saying it you have to wash yourself clean and stand before you know if you are not washing if you are found without that you will not enter the this this highway of holiness we rejoice come back to isaiah chapter 35 verse 10 the redeemed the ransom of the lord shall return with joy that is everlasting they will obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away if you come to revelation chapter 1 You know Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 says we rejoice because Jesus loved us and has washed us from our sins by his blood. We rejoice because our savior lives. Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 says he holds the key of death and Hades. We rejoice because he is going to come soon and he will right every wrong and he will be with us forever. we rejoice because he is our savior and in that day there will not be a temple 
but there will be the presence of God. We can worship in face to face. Revelation chapter 22, 3 to 5 says, No longer we will be there any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be within the city and His servants will worship Him and they will see Him face to face. On that day, there will not be a temple, there will not be a pulpit because you know why? Because God Himself will be there with us and we will see Him face to face. That's what this verse says. You know, they will see Him face to face and his name will be on their foreheads and there will no more be night in the city and they will have no need for the light or the lamp or the sun for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. Can we just rise in the presence of God? Can we all just rise in the presence of God? God is inviting you. This is an invitation for walking on the highway this is an invitation to walk in this highway of holiness the unclean shall not enter maybe you may think you are a fool there is a hope for you but the unclean will never enter the, the this highway you know people who are clean and washed by the blood of jesus they have washed their robes by the blood of jesus only those people can enter the highway of holiness there will not be any pain, there will not be any gloom or doom because God would be the hope and He would be at the center of that, that place. And that's why, you know, even Paul said, now we see Him in mirror, but one day we will see Him face to face. If there is anybody over here, maybe down or perplexed, maybe thinking that, you know, this this... This world is not how I was thinking about. Maybe things are not going the way you planned it. Or maybe you were, you were praying for certain things but it didn't happen that way. Let me just tell you, God is working in ways that we cannot see. And He is in, he's at work. As Jesus said in John chapter 5 that my Father is working and I have been working till now. We are busy. For what? To bring the kingdom of God into this world. If you do not know this Lord, our hope is not on this world. Our hope is in eternity where we actually will see Him face to face with the resurrected bodies and with a new heaven and new earth. Filthy rags before you. You cannot be 
life. God, we pray that let your kingdom come, oh Father Lord, that your yours will be done in my life, in our life, and together as a church, oh Father Lord. There is anybody who is sick, who is desperate, Lord, we pray that you may stretch forth your hands and heal them. And Lord, let there be, Father, revival and breakthroughs in their heart.